Welcome to The Hit Show, especially my loyal listeners in The Hit Squad. Here we talk about mastering hit, honesty, integrity, and transparency, where we invest in relational capital to create influence and how we wield that influence to create opportunities to make more money. Practically what we're going to show you is to teach you a way of creating a better quality of life because you may not have the quality of life that you want. This is why I interview these interesting people. I do it because they have that quality of life and they can show us how to get there. So pay attention to these guys and girls. One such person I have on today is Steve Sims. We actually met on Twitter, believe it or not. We were, we were uh, suggested to each other by another uh, Twitty. And Steve's the founder of the, and the CEO of the luxury con concierge service, Bluefish. And he also wrote a book in 2017 called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. You're going to hear in a moment where, he's, where, where he grew up, but let's roll with the show. And thank you so much for coming, Steve. How you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Blue fishing. Uh, let, we got to start with that. What is that? Where does that come from? <laughs> so I used to throw uh, clubs and parties. And one of my things I would do was I would actually tell people where the party was going to be. I would charge them. And then I would give them a password. It was like my filter to find out how game for a laugh they were. So you had to turn up at this event and you had to walk up to a doorman and you had to give them a silly phrase. The sillier, the better. And I had things like name two of the Teletubbies. The one that really got everyone was name the lion. The password is the name of the lion from the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Oh, my God. Now, I, st I started this back in the 90s. So people weren't exactly whipping out in that. Um, so, and the answer, by the way, before everyone falls over is Aslan. Yeah, I know. Um, <clears throat> which, actually uh, means lion, which actually means lion in Turkish. Oh, does it? Yeah. There you go. Educational already. Um, and one of the other passwords I had was um, finish this sentence. One fish, two fish, red fish. So people would literally walk up to the front door and they would go, blue fish. And we'd be like, oh, when you go, enjoy the night. And the daft thing is, as we grew this company of party planners and events and getting people into special launches and things, the only reason we were doing it was to build up a Rolodex of affluent people. Right. Without realizing it, we were be building up this kind of fun environment and, and social scene. And people started asking themselves and asking each other, where's that Bluefish company? You know, the, the, the Bluefish thing that we did. And so people actually came to me. And I remember someone actually came to me once and they said they want someone to do a birthday party. Um, who's that Bluefish company? And I remember literally kind of going, I don't know any Bluefish who, 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 who And the guy turned around and went, well, they looked after your party the other month. And I'm like, no, that was a password. And so before you realized it, yeah. or before we realized it, and we even set up a company with a completely different name, people were contacting us going, hey, are you that Bluefish company? And in the end, we had to do a name change. We were like, yeah, we are. And it grew. And as we tried to provide the absolute best party, the absolute best experience, the absolute best access. And we always wanted to do things that aroused and excited us. So whatever you wanted, we never gave you. We gave you more. We gave you what we wanted out of your dream. Right. Um, and this, this verb, this term, this action came out that people were saying, oh, you blue fished the crap out of that. Or, oh, that's blue fishing 101. And before you realized it, it became this, this verb, this action note. And so that's where it came from. Came from absolutely nothing. So that was mid 90s, you said? Yeah, it was early 90s. We started doing that when I was a doorman of a nightclub in a dodgy end of Hong Kong called Wan Chai. And then, yeah, about 93, 94. You know, it's funny, I didn't know this because 93 to 95, I was a doorman in Berlin, Germany. And <laughs> I was doing the same thing, but I wouldn't have passwords, but I was doing the same thing. One of the first techno clubs, like real basement underground illegal techno clubs in Berlin was called the Exit. Well, one was called Waldfish, funny, funny, you know, funny enough, close enough. And uh, there was one called Trezor and they were the three clubs. It was like a mafia. No one ever was open at the same time. So we made sure that the small scene of techno clubs always had a full club when they were open. It was, right. So that's how we did it. So yeah, that's funny. Come on the same thing. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I also went on to open clubs and cocktail bars and things. Best education. Deal, dealing with people like that. You know, huh? people talk about communication and relationship skills. And I don't want it's social skills. 
go to a decent bar because you'll get, you'll get a bunch of guys that have just come out of work. You'll get a bunch of lads that are on the pool for the night. You'll get a bunch of girls that are going out for fun. And the bar person, maid or man, will respond to each one of these completely different in a second based on how they lean in. And you'll get the girl or guy go up going, hey, guys, you're out for a good time. How may I help you? And then it'll be the boys. You'll be like, hey, boys, we're out for fun. And, hey, girls, you're looking good. They react differently on the exact same line. It's, it's an art form to watch. And, and it's also to their benefit. So the, the question begs, uh, why don't some people do it? And even if they know they're supposed to do it, where does that come from? Well, they know they're doing it because they need to connect. Right. Um, at the end of the day, if you want, every time you brush your teeth, you're looking at the slowest evolving technology in the planet, you. And the bottom line of it is we're primitive animals. We walk past a bush in muscles, we shit our pants or we jump or we fight. You know, we've got those responses right. because we're animals. The same animal instincts are there for us to connect, love, relate, sink, hold, hug, uh, right. nurture, breed, feed. They're all the primitives that are in us. And so when you do that with someone, there's the need to connect. Us as the customer talking to the bar person, we want to connect right. in a voice that we're understood. If we think we're posh, we want to be spoken to, Posh. Exactly. If, we think we're, if we think we're Coolio, we want to be spoken to as though we're Coolio. We want to be spoken to in the, in the frame that we want to be understood. And the bar person's doing it because they want to tip. And you go back to those places, don't you? Like you go back where you're treated great. You go back where people know you walk in. Hey, Steve, hey, how you doing? You know, it's like you feel good. And you bring people with you because... You're the man, you're the girl, you're the one, whatever, that when you walk in this club. Absolutely. We a, want to go back to our comfort areas. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So when did you leave London? Oh, God, I left London when I was uh, 21, uh, 21, 22. Uh, so I was a young lad in Hong Kong. And then I went Hong Kong, Bangkok, Geneva, Switzerland, Palm Beach, and I'm now sitting up here in sunny Los Angeles. And when did you make the switch from a uh, doorman, uh, let's say, party thrower, to concierge um so the only reason i was doing it, and it was it was a very similar story to your techno story okay but i worked it from a slightly different angle i was poor and i was a doorman and my five friends were also poor so i needed to find rich friends so i did i wanted to get these rich people to talk to me the only way to do it was to be a value to them Right. So as a doorman, I would say, hey, guys, not tonight. And they're like, hang on, we haven't even got in. You know, how can you be throwing us out? We haven't even got in yet. Um, and I would do this to my regulars only. And I'd be like, guys, I know you love this place. I know you pay well. I know you treat the ladies well. But however, tonight's not the night because there's a new club just down the road. Jimmy's there. Go and tell him Steve sent you. He'll let you in. And so I became an oracle. Now, the funny thing is the following night, they wouldn't go to that place. They would come back to me because I had told them the best place to go. Right. So I ended up building a value of where the best nightclubs were. And then I started on the bad nights, throwing my own parties in there. Uh, okay. And of course, now bringing these people in. And, and of course, you've got to pay the bar. You've got to pay the rent of the room. But then I thought to myself, well, hang on. Let's start doing it on a yacht for sale and see if some of my clients would buy that yacht. So I'd throw a party on a yacht sell the yacht, sell tickets to the party on the yacht, and then I would get a sponsor like Mercedes to sponsor the party. I was getting paid three times for the same party, and I was thinking to myself, yes. someone's going to stop me soon. Yeah, you no. know, there's no way that this can be real, and it, they never did. And I started taking over penthouses, mansions, yeah. started throwing parties in Macau, uh, Manila, um, Bali, taking over these big mansions, and then I would do... Then I would sidle up with major events in like Monaco and the Hollywood. I was traveling over to the Hollywood award season, uh, getting people into parties and making my own parties when I was still living in Switzerland. And now I'm living here. So it's just still being done. Where'd you live in Switzerland? I lived in Geneva. I, I, I lived in uh, Zurich, yeah. So I was also in Switzerland. I lived in the, it's, it's funny. Yeah, so many similarities. Yeah, that's crazy. I had no idea. Same name too, go figure. Um, <laughs> So then you went, you went to, the, to Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, Florida, or? Yeah, so what happened was uh, in 97, the, uh, the Chinese took back Hong Kong. Right. So there was a, a flood of expatriates leaving Hong Kong because uh, obviously the tax regime and everything changed. So we all went down to Bangkok and I carried on doing the thing. Now, bearing in mind, 
I never wanted to be the world's top concierge. And now my requests were moving from, you know, hey, I want to go to a good party to, hey, I, I want to drive a Formula One car or I want a drum lesson by Guns N' Roses or I want Beyonce to come and sing at my wedding. Right. You know, the, the, I became this fixer. I became this guy that could. Right. Um, and it literally was just an idea to, okay, get more rich people in my network and then I can ask them for a job. Then I can understand. And all it was, was I would go along to a client we would talk about throwing that birthday party in Monaco. And then I was able to sit there and go, so how long have you been doing this then? And it gave me an excuse to yeah. sit in that sandpit okay. and ask him questions. Yeah. Awesome. And of course, dealing with some of the richest and most powerful people in the world, I got to ask some really good questions to really interesting people. And it just grew. And so then I moved into Geneva, started looking after all the European events, you know, Wimbledon, Stard, Monaco Grand Prix. And then... <clears throat> I moved over to Palm Beach in 2000, uh, and I've been here ever since. Wow, crazy. You know, it's funny, I sort of did the same. I, I worked for Mick Jagger, Andrea Bocelli, Olivia Newton-John. Oh, Andrea like Bocelli, that. another link of ours. Yes, indeed. Well, I, I, that was until two years ago. Like, I actually worked and, and managed some of his, his, uh, some of his orchestra and some of his okay. business. So I did some, some of his PR in, 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 in Hungary. I'm calling from Budapest right now. So Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was, I sort of have that thing, but I did it as like, uh, just, I don't know, extension of my consulting. I never got into the party scene with them. Although what I did turn up to be for a lot of these people was a fixer. Right. So yeah. I, fixed I fixed this to this day. I fix things for people. It's it's crazy. So yeah. sort of like you on a smaller scale, I guess, or pro probably more on the business side and less on the leisure side. Um, and that's what I, that's what I want to, I want to get to. I mean, how do you just pick up the phone and call? Okay. You've been at it for a while, obviously. But I saw your last gig was in LA or something with Elton John. Is that correct? Yeah, we've been working with Elton John for about five years now for his Oscar party. And uh, we partnered with that. And uh, it's a great cause. It's a great event. And uh, we help market, promote, and get the right people into the event. Okay. And who calls you? Like, who shows up at your door? And who calls you? Who reaches out and says, hey, I need some help? Oh, Struth. Well, a lot of people think I deal with the rich and famous. I don't. I deal with the richer and unknown. So I deal with people that own things like... Yeah, I deal with people that own things like countries and banks and major brands. Um, and they contact me. And his, there's two things. It's funny. The richer and more powerful you are, the less you ever want to hear the word no. Yeah. Because you could pick up the phone and you could go, hey, I own England. I need to get into this event. And the person on the other end of the phone may take glory in refusing you right and then that will be spread around and go oh, no we're very exclusive we even turned down the king of england you don't want that so yeah. they come to me and they go hey steve i need two tickets into this i need you to build this i need you to get me access to this i need you to get me to the front of the line of this and i go and make it happen without ever revealing the client's name nice and so nice. If, if for any reason um it doesn't come off they're protected and I'm okay because I can now go a different route. I'm a yeah. great believer that if I get a no, I'm asking the wrong question or the wrong person. Yeah. Yeah. There's always why another why give up? Why give up? There's always a way. There's no, you mentioned Bocelli. Um, I had a client that wanted to have an exclusive restaurant. Uh, this was the only thing he asked me. I want an exclusive restaurant this Wednesday night. It was Sunday. I was in Rome this Wednesday night in Florence. Um, I told you earlier, we don't want to do anything that doesn't excite us. We, we do stuff that excites us that you right. just happen to go on. So what we ended up doing was taking over the Academia Museum, setting up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, and then during that food, had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade him. And that was the level that we actually go to because we want to do what excites us. And I know, I know what he takes too. So, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So it was, uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. So it's a lot of making sure you've got credibility. Right. It's a lot of establishing the value in the relationship. Um, and it's a lot just down to the barman again, uh, or the bar person, should we say. It's about establishing a clear, defined value to keep me in the conversation with you. Okay, so uh, that's easy for, you know, the wealthy who own England, right? So what about, what about John down the street who wants to do something for his wife and he reaches out to you? Do you work according to percentages of what they, what they spend or do they have a flat rate or how's that work? Just, I'm just curious. No, absolutely. There's no question I won't answer. Um, so I have to be honest with you, John down the road, we're not dealing with. 
Um, see, for a start, my website doesn't even have a phone number. So there's a lot of companies out there and go, oh, we're referral based, you know, please go here and apply for the, you know, no, we don't have a way of contacting us. So everyone that comes to us, it's a case of, oh, Steve told me about your services. And then we'll go, okay, let's, let's schedule a time for us to interview. And right. we will interview every person. Then the next thing is we charge them $5,000 and that $5,000 gets to my phone number. Okay? okay. And I will talk to them. Okay. And then the next step is, okay, now we need a retainer. And so then there will be a retainer that they have to drop into the account of like, you know, 150 grand. Yeah. And then it's a case of, okay, now what do you want to do with your life? How do you want to get more? Now, some people may go like authors. We deal with a lot of very high end authors and entrepreneurs that have a mad travel plan yeah. and they may turn up in Miami and then all of a sudden they got a speaking gig in New York. And while they're there, they need to make sure they're in the restaurant that no one can get a reservation. Yeah, you know, we do that kind of stuff and we can eat into the retainer they've got. Right. And then we've got other clients that say, Hey, once a year, I want to go to Monaco Grand Prix. Like I own it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we won't start working with them until about January when we start planning it. So the idea of Johnny down the road reaching out to us and going, ah, yeah. I don't have a lot of money. Yeah. Arrogantly, but respectfully, we don't work at that I get level. It. I get it. I get it. I, yeah. I think I, I wanted to know that differentiation. I want to I remind everybody you're watching The Hit Show uh, with Stephen Kuhn, and we're talking to the one and only Steve Sims about his glue fishing. So when you, when you brought the book out, you uh, you t t teaching people how to do it now, or what, what's, what's the book uh, about? It went, it went, it went kind of crazy. So... Since about 2006, prior to 2006, there's a ton of media on the company and on me right. uh, because I was well known as always being in the place, always being in the background of every picture of every high, you know, right. affluent person. So I was a curiosity factor. Um, and I did a lot of speeches around the planet on the state of luxury, how to communicate with your client, how to get them to pay in advance. That was my field. Um, and then past of a session in about 2007, I started doing a lot more entrepreneurial events where they were going, how do you, as let's be blunt, an ugly British bouncer get to do this with the Pope and Andrea Bocelli? Yeah. Um, and so then it became more of a case of, look, if a bricklayer, which is still the only thing I'm qualified to do from East London, can be doing this? You're already out of excuses, but your head's either up your ass or you're, you're, you're holding yourself back. Holy shit, we talk the same freaking language. I, like, I'm sitting in Budapest, Hungary, right? And I'm listed as the number two military entrepreneur influencer in America. I don't even live there. I'm, I'm flowing over to the state. I'm, I'm flowing over to the state. And I did it in three months. Like, I went online last October, and three months later, I was the number two influencer. And then I get booked um, in the States to open up military veteran events as a, as a keynote speaker, like Jocko Willink. Yep. Yeah, I yeah, opened, yeah. I opened up, and then he spoke, and I'm like, okay, I'm living in some 2,000 person town. You know, it's like how, you know I mean? so there's, there's, there's a way, and this is where the attitude comes in that, that, that you're talking about. Just, yeah, it just, it. just fucking do it. It man. was, it it was weird. Away. And I got asked, I got asked to do the book <clears throat> actually about five years ago. <laughs> and the book was asked, the, the premise of the book was, hey, can you, can you do a tell all? Can you reveal all the things you do for the affluent clients you do it for? And, and it was like, no, I'd be dead by cocktail yeah, hour. Yeah. And then, then they asked me after I did a speech and I don't know who got hold of it, but someone within the, uh, the publishing house saw it and they went, Hey, instead of you doing the book on what you do, why don't you do the book on how you do it? So up until 2000, up until October the 17th, 2017, about 200 people in the planet knew who I was, including my mum and dad. And that was fine by me. I was the unknown guy. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting flown around like you, paid to do speeches. I'm now consulting with uh, entrepreneurs on how they could do it and hopefully exposing the fact that you don't need all of the other things that you think you need. You don't need a $60,000 CRM program nope. if you haven't got a freaking client. Nope. You don't need any nope. of these things. Just get started, get started, influence, building influence, wielding that influence, exactly. God, I love it, man. We're speaking the same language. I don't know why we talk more and more, more before. I'm always watching you. You're brash. I love it because for me, I was in, uh, you know, when I was working in, in, in Europe, I worked with some politicians and, some, and a bunch of royals and stuff, so I sort of like honed my temperament. 
Because let's face it, I was a soldier. I was in the tanks. I was in the, I was in the war. I got out of the war. I was a doorman. You know, no. you know, you just speak, right? You know, that's just how it is. So I've sort of honed my, my skills over the years. So it's hard to let go sometimes. You know, when you're, you know, when you're down, back down in the pit, some people are like, what's, what's, what's stick up your ass? You're like, oh, excuse me. I need to get back to where, where my roots are. Because you're so used to working at that level, right? So, yeah. so it's, it's sort, sort of cool to see how you, I don't want to say it's disingenuous of me, but I sort of, I sort of fit like a chameleon into, into my surroundings. Because, you know, when you're hanging out with the crown prince of yeah. Italy or whatever, you can't go, hey, mate, <laughs> slap him on the back, you know? So, yep, yep. But keeping that authenticity is always key. And that's part of HIT, Honesty, Integrity, Transparency, which is the, 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 the programs that I run. By the way, I saw you running the program now. Tell us about that. Yeah, it, yeah, as I say, the whole thing's just got crazy. So the book came out, and I'll be honest with you, I thought when the book came out, I thought to myself, I don't know if this is going to do good because I poured everything into the book that I wanted, wanted everyone to know about me, okay? Right. And so I wrote the book that I would want people to read, but more importantly, my kids to read. Wow. And, Great. and when it came out, the publishing house, they gave me 2,500 bu bucks, and they went, right, Barnes & Noble, which is a big bookstore in America, they have, a, uh, they have a branch down by you in Hollywood. Get a table in there, get some champagne, and sit there at 6 o'clock at night, and we'll get a stack of books, and you sign them. And I thought, I am not sitting in Barnes & Noble signing <laughs> books. you know. So I took the two and a half grand. Um, I went to a whiskey bar that I know. I invited a bunch of my friends. And I went, there's 2,500 bucks, you know, just keep, keep oh, pouring until we run out. Um, and I just had a bunch of friends turned up and we just got plastered in this whiskey bar. And that did really well, yeah. that, that kind of thing. And the first, the first month I remember we sold, I think it was about, it was less than 500 copies. Right. Okay. And I've never done a book before. So I remember contacting them going, well, you know, how's that? Is that good? And they're like, uh, uh, no. no. You just make 30 no. cents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's not, no, that's not. So I was like, Oh, and I remember thinking, well, that was fun. Yeah. You know, at least I've done a book, you know, my lights are still on. I still yeah. run the concierge. You know, we'll be all right. Second month, I think it was like a thousand books. Third month was like 14,000 and it just, it just escalated. So then we started, I started getting a lot of people contacting me going, Hey, I've got to talk to you about something. And I thought, you know, you're not paying for my 30 minutes. You're paying for my, uh, you know, yeah. 20 odd years yeah. that it's taken me to get that. So I literally went, you want to talk to me? 500 bucks. Yeah. And I put that up on the website and you get the haters. You know, yeah. why are you worth 500 bucks? Don't. I don't know. I don't care if I'm worth 500 bucks. Are you worth 500 bucks? <laughs> and before I realized it, I was getting a lot of people, yeah. you know, take it up. It got to a point where my calendar was booked three months in advance just for doing half hour phone calls. Right. And then I said, well, look, no. why don't we get everyone in a room and see if we can do it over two days? You know, oh. we'll hot sit. Nice. And we ended up launching something we called the speakeasy. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that is. Okay, good. Yeah. So the speakeasy was maximum of 40 people. You don't know who's going to be there. And in fact, going back to my roots of bluefish, you don't even know where it's going to be. Okay, so and what we did was we send people a map and we give them a circle of like a two mile radius and go, it's got to be in here. Hang out there. So, yeah. So we give them, you know, some hotels around the area that they can grab. And we try to find a place that they normally never would be in. And so we did it in New York. Uh, we did it in um, San Diego in a mansion over uh, the ocean. We did it in uh, New York. It was in a dark. Day and it in a New York loft that had been the oldest brothel in New York, the last closed brothel of New York. Um, so we want to put you in a room that you normally would not be in with people that you should mingle with. But then here's the key. Here's the key. And you're a speaker, so you know what this is like. We go along to events, and the events are quite often sold on the fact of who the speakers are. Right. So people come along to see a couple of speakers, and then they stay for the other few. Right. Okay? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Not every speaker will resonate, will relate, have anything of any interest right. to tell right. them. Right. Okay? So I thought, I don't want to do an event based on who's coming. I want to do an event on what's the problem. Yes. So people buy the tickets, and then I say to them, okay, 
You bought the ticket, Steve, that's fantastic. Why would you do that? What's your problem? Right. Ah. And they go, well, you know, I want to be more speak. I want to do more speaking gigs. I want to write a book. I, I'm having trouble because the amount of work I do, um, I'm getting over, uh, overstressed. Um, I'm, I forget things. I want to do more viral videos. I want to do a podcast. And then I go, great. And having a pretty good Rolodex like I do, right. I then go into it and I get those people in the room and to yeah. solve the problems. Yeah. And you, awesome. you have, and again, 40 people, that's a yeah. small room. Yeah. Massively small, yeah, yeah. And you yeah. can actually point out, you can go, hey, Steve, you said, I've got Roger yeah. here, and your problem was so-and-so. Why don't you ask the leading, like I had a guy that wanted to, um, uh, a lot of the questions I got for New York were around doing videos. Right. Okay. So I had, uh, and they said, you know, I, I could do a video. I've got this. So we had one guy go through the basic stuff you needed. You know, the difference between a dynamic mic um, and uh, what the uh, difference between a 1080 or 4K, showing different uh, GoPro, Mevo. So they went through the basic stuff you need. Right. Okay. And then what I did was I had the guy that does all of Victoria's Secrets and Ralph Lauren's adverts sit in the room and tell you about how to sell a story in video. Nice. And so you've got the guy that's done every single Victoria's Secrets campaign yeah. and every single Ralph Lauren campaign answering you how to put a video on YouTube. That reminds so, me of the retreats of uh, like Baby Bathwater. I'm sure you know Baby Bathwater. Yeah, right? I know Baby Bathwater, and that's a that's the exact yeah. same kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Actually, and, that's, uh, that's the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, oh, was that the member nine? So did you yeah. go down to Croatia? Yes. Last year? Yes. Yeah, I was supposed to speak at that event, but I couldn't make it, and I have to be honest with you, I didn't want to live in a tent. It's actually that's what I thought, but it's literally it's literally like a cabin. Are you there? You're frozen a little bit. One second. You'll be coming back in a second. One second. You'll be coming back. It's... Are you there, Steve? Uh-oh. Am I back? Yeah, now you're back. Am I so, back? No, actually, I said the same thing. Oh, no. Am I go oh, yes. out here. You're back. So, actually, I said the same thing, but it's not... A, it's literally four... Like, it's, it's got a full porcelain bathroom, a shower. It's not a tent. It just has a canvas roof to make it look like a tent. Ah, yeah. I didn't know that. I yeah. didn't know that. So yeah, I bailed on it. But uh, yeah, baby bathwater. I can only you know you got mastermind talks with Jason Gaynard. You got Joe Polish Genius Network. Uh, you got Mind Speak Easy, Baby Bathwater. There's a lot of great events out there that um, promote how to solve your problem over. Yeah. Hey, turn up, you'll see this guy. And I that's like that attitude. And that's what I did. And again, same thing. I didn't know if anyone would want to go. Right. So I, I, I put the speakeasy together. You don't know who's going to be there. You don't know where it is, but I'm going to solve your problem. Right. And uh, as I say, it's, uh, we're on our fourth one in Los Angeles on the 21st, well, in February. Um, right. no, I'm not going to pitch it. Um, and uh, we got a bunch of people turning up, and then afterwards we're all going to go to Elton John's Oscar party. So Yeah, so that's awesome, man. Oh, congratulations. That's, that's, I mean, I, I don't think anybody can really compete with that. Like, <laughs> well, I think it's easy to meet Elton John. That's sort of cool. Yeah. Um, the thing is, and I don't want to take it, uh, I won't take it arrogantly, but the bottom line of it is no, no one will ever be able to compete against it because quite simply, of everyone that you've just spoken about, they're all great at being themselves. Yeah. And I'm absolutely exceptional at being myself. So there's not going to be another Steve Sim speakeasy. There may be another person do one. Yeah, and no, I wish yeah. you all the best. And I want you to do what works for you when you're all in as you. Okay, so let's talk about being all in as you because that's what we talk about, authenticity all the time. Authenticity, standing there, full and total you, no expectations, no nothing, just be you. So let's drop some, you know, some bombs now. What do you got? for people out there that are standing before their hurdles, now, entrepreneurs specifically, because that's, that's my audience, yep. owner, owner operators. So what are some things that entrepreneurs can do to get, you know, get their shit in gear, get moving, get, get rolling. You know, everyone tries to be perfect. You already mentioned that one, right? Just go, drop the CRM, just get, make some money, get rolling, and then we can start talking about CRMs, right? Yeah. What yeah, else yeah. Can, 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 can you say in that area? So I didn't realize I was doing it until Ari Mizell told me I'd been doing it all my life. I'm a great believer in get going, then get good. Yeah. Um, 
And there's a lot of people that say, hey, I'm, I'm doing this business. And then they will search perf for perfection before they release it. And the bottom line of it is perfection is a, is a blue unicorn with three testicles. It doesn't <laughs> exist. Okay. So I want you to just sit there and go, all right, I'm going to launch this product. I've got no CRM. I've got no back end. I've just got an email and I've got a link if you want to buy the freaking thing. Yeah. And if I sell one, great. If the following week I sell three, great. That's called a curve. Yeah. You know, yeah. keep going on that. And if you keep multiplying like that, then you can get a back end. You see right. all of that shit you can do. But right. the bottom line of it is get out of the way of yourself. Don't chase perfection because it doesn't exist. We already know what it looks like. And it's got three testes and just start doing it. Listen up, Hit Squad. You just heard from Steve, you know, one of those people who sort of made it. This should be inspiring to you. If it's not, then we need to talk. You know, the Hit Squad's, you know, the hit squad's everything to me. And I want you to be successful. So listen to Steve and heed. So what's the best advice that you ever got? Uh, it was my dad. Um, and it was when I was a kid. Now, my dad is, uh, you know, I'm a big, thick Irish lad. Okay, never changed. Uh, my dad is a bigger, thicker Irish lad. <laughs> and I remember, I remember walking down the road with him one day. And I was about 13 years old. We weren't talking. He was smoking cigarettes. We were walking on a building site towards the cabin. Um, and it was cold. And I just remember, as I say, no conversation. And as he's walking and he's smoking his hundredth cigarette of that hour, he just puts his hand on my shoulder and didn't look at me, but we still carried walking and went, son, no one ever drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. And then he takes his hand off my shoulder and carries on walking. Now, I remember this clear as day. I remember we were walking through crunchy, damp mud. I remember the chill. I remember how wet I was. I remember standing still and watching him walk off with a puff of smoke going because it's partly cold and it's the cigarette. And I remember going, what the hell was that? And it just, it made no sense to me at the ripe old age of 13. And I, it wasn't until years later that it suddenly clocked on me that we have a choice of whether or not we're staying down there or not. Hey Amen, brother. I, I thought you were going to say, then it hit me. But <laughs> you're like, what the hell was that? <laughs> yeah, no, at the age of 13, I had no idea where that was coming say, from. Dude, 13, that kind of insight, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I went for another 10 years thinking that my dad was a moron and not understanding a bloody thing he said, but he uh, was like some kind of a wise, wise old uh, Irish guru. <laughs> is, your, is, your, is your Irish guru dad still around? No, he passed away last year. Uh, sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. Well, bless him. Bless we all him. go. Yeah, we do. I guess that's something we all have to do. That's one thing we all have in common, isn't it? Yep. Well, we're winding up near, near the end, and what I like to do at the end is sort of ask, you know, what, you know when you're, you're where you are, right? Where is line of integrity for you? Or you're just so far where you can say, I do what the hell I want to do, period, done, and it's always this or it's always that. Or are there situations where, let's say, I don't know, I don't want to name anybody you don't like, so let me guess, uh, Angela Merkel, you know, the, the, the chancellor of Germany, comes yep. to you and says, look, I need you to do this for me. And you're like, uh, might not be so, you know, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? When you got that power right. on that? Yeah, no, it's very, very easy. Um, I'm a great believer that my gut is more intelligent than my head. And so if it doesn't sit right in there, I don't touch it. So if I, I'll have a client come to me and go, hey, I'm trying to land this deal. Um, I know Richard Branson's at this event. I need to be on his table at the event. And I'll be like, well, what? why is that? I'm going to stick you on a table. To Just pick. No, I want to make sure that whatever I do, I focus on the integrity of what I'm doing over the dollar signs that are coming in my bank account. Good for you. That, and you know, I'm I'm finding that I don't know, I don't want to call it vibrations of the planet or whatever. But the more and more people I talk to that are the that up there, you know, like you, successful, very very successful, making the big bucks, or whatever you want to call it, or the uber big bucks, it seems to be a, like a ringing policy, and everyone's like they're sticking to their integrity. Now, I thought about that often, and I'm, I'm hardcore also to my own detriment sometimes. And um, I'm thinking like, okay, once you get to a certain point, you don't really have to worry about it because you can literally say no and it doesn't hurt you, right? So that's where, sort of where I feel like I am. But what do you get? What kind of advice would you give somebody who's down there and it's like, look, I need to feed my family. 
and I got to do this. And it's probably not a good deal, like a drug deal, like, you know, cross the border or whatever, like go from Holland to Berlin with some weed. There's no borders, but you could get stopped, but probably won't be. Make 50 grand. You know, what do you say to someone like that? Uh, don't do it. Let it go. See, yeah. I, I, have this, I have the same, I'm the same person now with my bank account as I was when I had a smaller one. If the deal works for me, I want to be able to sleep safely. I want to be able to hug my wife. Hey, if I have to get a hamburger, a 99 cent hamburger and cut it into four pieces yeah. so we all get a piece, I'm going to do that rather than do something that may mean that tomorrow night I don't come home. Amen. Okay? Amen. You, you sell any part of your integrity, you will not get it back. Exactly. The cost is too heavy. I love it. I love it. You just said something about your wife. How important is she in the whole scheme of things for you, for business, for everything? Everything. If she no longer, if she left me now, then, um, and we've been together, she was 16, I was 17. So she's my best friend. She's the most terrifying partner I know. Uh, she's the most arousing partner I know. She's beautiful. She's wonderful. She, she's everything. Bottom line is that if she goes, I've just lost the use of my arms, legs, yeah. head, mouth. Cool. We are so yin yang that we operate each other seamlessly. That's beautiful. I didn't realize you were together that long. Congratulations. That's crazy. Forever, forever. She yeah. was my first girl and uh, will be my last girl. My. Well, that's, that's beautiful. Man. Well, I, I'm, I'm on my second wife and she's uh, amazing too. So I sort of caught the curve on that one. Uh, Good. Well, look, <laughs> hey, not every, you got you to gotta try. If it didn't work for me and Claire, then we wouldn't be together. Yeah. So. Exactly. Anyone that's out there on their third wife, fourth wife, fifth wife, you haven't found the right one yet. Yes, amen. That. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, I, although I do remember, do you know the actor James Kahn? Yes, of course. James Kahn oh, yeah. actually, yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. James Kahn uh, did all the Godfather movies and all the Matthew movies. Right. He turned around and he said that um, marriage should be like a driving license. When you lose it four times, you shouldn't be allowed to get it back. So <laughs> I, mean, I really liked his comment on that. Well, that's that's probably specifically for the American crowd because that seems to be where the most, where the most uh, you know divorces are. Anyway, we're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're at the end of our time, and you know I know you're busy. Got to head head off. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Awesome talking to you, chilling out like this, and just sort of having like a garage talk, literally. So yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Could you tell people quite shortly where they can find you or things you yeah. like? Your course? Where are they going to find your course? I actually saw it today on Facebook and I saw that your book was launched in Taiwan or China or something. Yeah. It's best selling in bloody uh, Taiwan in Chinese. Um, so it's gone worldwide. Um, if you want to find the course, it's at bluefish Steve. If you want to find more Sims, S I M S Steve D Sims.com. If you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll actually get uh, a little PDF on the cheat sheet of the book and you'll get one of my favorite videos. So, and I'm also on Instagram at Steve D. Sims. And you're on, you're on Twitter, which is where we met. I'm so. on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm all over the place. <laughs> Steve, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thanks, pal. All right. Hit Squad, thank you so much. Once again, we have an amazing guest on. Every Tuesday, tune in to see who's coming next. And thanks, Steve, uh, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to be watching what's going on with you. Take care. Hit Squad, take care. Have a fantastic day. And remember one thing, it's all about quality of life. See you next time.